All right, let's get started with part two of our virtual class lecture. To, uh, now we're going to get started with external respiration in the lungs. So I've already defined this way back on Monday in class. External respiration in the lungs is the exchange of oxygen from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries and exchanging that for carbon dioxide coming out of the pulmonary capillaries and going into the alveolar air. So it's exchange of respiratory gases between capillaries and alveolar air. All right. So we have oxygen will diffuse from alveolar air with a partial pressure of oxygen of 105 millimeters of mercury into the blood of pulmonary capillaries with a partial pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury. Wait a minute, does anybody remember what I said the partial pressure of oxygen in air was? Let's flip back a couple of slides and see what that was. The partial pressure of oxygen in fresh air was 158 millimeters of mercury. Why is it suddenly so much less? All right, so there's a big difference between 158.8 millimeters of mercury and 105 millimeters of mercury, but that's what the partial pressure is in your alveoli. So let's see what happens. Now up at the top I've drawn two sort of illustrations of the respiratory system. The black tubes indicate the conducting zone, the anatomical dead space, and the green blob indicates the alveoli. So let's see what happens. We're going to breathe in. So as we breathe in, we're going to breathe in a tidal volume. So we're going to fill up. We'll send that nice fresh air all the way down. Oh, I hate that thing. Sorry. All the way down into the lungs. And we're going to begin to fill up the lungs with that fresh oxygen. And then also remember some of that fresh air, 30% of it gets trapped in the anatomical dead space. All right, so that's our fresh air. Now as we are breathing in, we are also sending, we're, we're sending some of the oxygen, we're taking in oxygen, we're giving off carbon dioxide. So over time, this air, begins to change and we pull out as much oxygen as possible. Pull out as much oxygen as possible and we load in as much carbon dioxide as possible and that exchange occurs in the alveoli in the respiratory zone but not in that conducting zone. And then we breathe out. So as we breathe out this air begins to exit, oops, it begins to exit, so it goes up into the conducting zone. So this is found up in the conducting zone. All right, so what we find up there in the conducting zone is the air that we have breathed out. Now what do you think is the first air that goes back into the lungs, back into the alveoli? You're right. It's that used up air where you have already uh, eliminated as much oxygen as possible and pulled that oxygen into the capillaries and loaded on as much carbon dioxide as possible. That's the first air that comes back in. So really when we begin to look at the fresh air that goes down into, sorry, when we begin to look at the fresh air that goes down into the lungs, we have 150 is, so 150 millimeters is essentially millimeters of, I'm sorry, milliliters, milliliters of the used, if you will, air where you've already had gas exchange, okay? And then we only have 200 more, 200 milliliters, sorry, milliliters, if I can put the M, milliliters of fresh air. 
Okay, so we have 150 milliliters of the used air and 200 milliliters of fresh air. So when we combine all that together, we end up with a lower partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. It's down at 105 millimeters of mercury. But that's still a lot higher of a pressure than the pressure we see here and that's the pressure that we see in the deoxygenated genated blood. So deoxygenated blood isn't completely lacking blood. Uh, I'm sorry, deoxygenated blood isn't completely lacking oxygen. It's just very low oxygen. Right? So here we have our pressure gradient of 105 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolar air, to 40 millimeters of mercury of partial pressure of oxygen in the capillaries, in the pulmonary capillaries. So diffusion will occur. It will go down that pressure gradient and keep on until the partial pressure of oxygen in the pulmonary capillary is the same as in the alveolar air and that's going to be equal to 105 millimeters of mercury. All right, so the pressures will be equal. But there is some blood in the pulmonary capillaries that was found around the conducting portion of the respiratory system and you're not going to have gas exchange occurring there. Uh, so when it all comes back into the pulmonary veins to be returned to the heart, it drops down just a little bit to 100 millimeters of mercury. So that's the number that we use when we talk about the partial pressure of oxygen circulating in the oxygenated blood through the systemic system, through those systemic arteries and arterioles. All right, so that's the movement of oxygen. We load oxygen from the alveolar air into the pulmonary capillaries, going down a partial pressure gradient of 105 millimeters of mercury to 40 millimeters of mercury, and then a temporary drop, a small drop, to 100 millimeters of mercury. Now let's look at carbon dioxide and what happens with carbon dioxide. When you breathe, you usually will breathe out a higher percentage of carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide level in the deoxygenated blood, that low oxygen blood in the pulmonary capillaries, will be 45 millimeters of mercury. All right, so 45 millimeters of mercury is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the deoxygenated blood, the blood that has come from all of your systemic tissues. It's going to go down a pressure gradient into the alveolar air where the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 40 millimeters of mercury. Now hang on again. Let's look and remember in fresh air the partial pressure of carbon dioxide was 0 0.3 millimeters of mercury, really low. But it's the same reason once again. When we breathe in, the first 150 milliliters that goes into our alveoli is essentially the used air. It's already had gas exchange. Then that's followed by 200 milliliters of fresh air with that different partial pressure. So what we end up with for the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveolus will be 40 millimeters of mercury. But once again, we still have a partial pressure gradient. This time it's a lot slower of a partial pressure gradient from 45 millimeters of mercury to 40 millimeters of mercury. It will offload the carbon dioxide until the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood becomes 40 millimeters of mercury. Now, this is helped out. This is a really low pressure gradient. And if we were talking about oxygen, that wouldn't be a very effective pressure gradient. But carbon dioxide is very soluble in water, which means not only does it move into water really well, but it exits water really well as well. So uh, even though it's a low pressure gradient, it's still adequate to get rid of that carbon dioxide. 
So that's external respiration. Moving oxygen into the pulmonary capillaries down a partial pressure gradient and moving carbon dioxide out of the pulmonary capillaries down a partial pressure gradient. So let's look at a, uh, the next type is internal respiration. Internal respiration is the exchange of respiratory gases between the systemic capillaries and your tissues. So really going from the systemic capillaries to the interstitial fluid around your tissue cells. Right. So first let's look at oxygen and its transfer. Oxygen will diffuse from the systemic capillary blood where it has a partial pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury. We already saw where we, where we got that figure. And into the tissue cells. Now an average tissue cell, one that's neither, it's not really metabolically slow or really metabolically fast. It's just an average tissue cell will have a partial pressure of oxygen of 40 millimeters of mercury. Remember, your cells are going to use oxygen in the process of aerobic cellular respiration to make most of a cell's ATP. So as it uses up that oxygen, it's going to eliminate the oxygen that's going to drop the partial pressure of oxygen right around the cells. So you'll have a low oxygen environment around the cells and now the oxygen can move from a higher partial pressure in the systemic capillaries into the interstitial fluid and then on into the tissue cells. So by the time the blood moves all the way through a capillary bed it usually will drop from 100 millimeters of mercury at the beginning of the capillary bed to 40 millimeters of mercury of oxygen when it exits the capillary bed. Carbon dioxide. Now as these cells are active with aerobic cellular respiration they use up oxygen but they are producing the carbon dioxide. So right around your tissues, the cells are giving off carbon dioxide and you have a local partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the interstitial fluid of around 45 millimeters of mercury. In the systemic capillaries coming from the lungs, from the, from the lungs to the heart and now out to the tissues, we have a partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the capillaries of 40 millimeters of mercury. So we're going to move that carbon dioxide from the tissues to the systemic capillaries until it reaches 45 millimeters of mercury, till it's at equilibrium. And then that will return that higher carbon dioxide blood back to the heart and then back to the lungs. All right. So that 40, let's go back up and look at that oxygen. Again, the partial pressure in most, I said in an average tissue cell, is going to be 40 millimeters of mercury. So that's at rest. And at that level, you actually only take off about 25% of the available oxygen from the blood. The deoxygenated blood has a lower partial pressure, but that still has lots of oxygen available. It still has about 75% of its oxygen capacity. So while you're at rest, you are not stripping 100% of the oxygen out of the blood and moving it into the tissues. There's still a lot that's available. Right? And we're going to see some graphs of this later on. All right, so let's look at a, a summary or, or overview. So up here, you can see we're in the alveolus. So we would say that this was the area where you had that external respiration. And in that case, we are going to, here's our alveolar air right there with a partial pressure of oxygen of 105 millimeters of mercury and a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 40 millimeters of mercury.
All right. So we load oxygen into the blood and we offload carbon dioxide from the blood. All right. From the pulmonary capillaries, that's going to go back to the heart. So it's going to go into the heart through the left atrium, out the down to the left ventricle, and then out the aorta, and we're going to go to all the tissue cells. Okay. At the tissue cells in the systemic capillaries, we offload oxygen and we onload carbon dioxide. All right. So the partial pressure going to the tissue cells will be partial pressure of oxygen. Partial pressure of oxygen will be 100 millimeters of mercury. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide will be 40 millimeters of mercury. We go to the tissue cells and at the tissue cells on an average tissue cell we have a partial pressure of oxygen of 40 and a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 45. So we offload oxygen and we onload carbon dioxide to the systemic capillaries. Then that deoxygenated blood, which remember still has lots of oxygen in it, so our deoxygenated blood has a partial pressure of oxygen of 40 and a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 45. That gets returned to the heart, so we're back to the heart, this time into the right atrium, down to the right ventricle, out the pulmonary trunk, and to the pulmonary arteries, and eventually going to the pulmonary capillaries, where once again we have external respiration. So we have internal respiration at the tissues, and external respiration at the alveoli. Now this occurs fairly quickly, this exchange of gases. All right. So the speed or the rate of pulmonary gas exchange and the speed or the rate of systemic gas exchange will depend on the partial pressure gradients. All right. So you have to have a partial pressure gradient. The alveolar partial pressure of oxygen must be higher than the blood partial pressure of oxygen for diffusion to occur. How, what, could, what could change the partial pressure? Well, increasing altitude, definitely. So increasing altitude could definitely change that partial pressure. The pressure decreases. So pressure, atmospheric pressure decreases with altitude. All right, so the higher you go up in altitude, the less the partial pressure. It may not seem like very much, but if you go uh, get on an airplane and fly immediately to Denver, Denver, Colorado, it's called the Mile High City for a reason, you are much higher in altitude, and the partial pressures, the total atmospheric pressure, and therefore the partial pressures, will be much lower. And so temporarily, you're going to have to do some physiologic adaptations to be able to deal with that. But right off the bat, as soon as you walk off that airplane, you're not going to be adapted or acclimated for being in that lower partial pressure. All right, another aspect that might influence how fast pulmonary gas exchange and systemic gas exchange occurs is the total surface area available for gas exchange. Now this total surface area, really important aspect about that would be any lung damage. So if you had lung damage, like let's say you were a chronic pack a day smoker for about 40 years, you might expect that some of the impurities found in that tobacco as you burn it will damage some of your lung tissue. So that's going to, if you begin to develop scar tissue, that's less total area available for gas exchange. Something else is the diffusion distance. Now this can also be due to lung damage as well. If you begin to develop any scar tissue in that really thin respiratory membrane, that's going to uh, decrease or it's going to 
sorry, increase the time it takes for the gases to be exchanged. And then, of course, we also have something that you can't change, and that's the molecular weight and solubility of the gases. So oxygen has low molecular weight, and usually things that have low molecular weight will diffuse fairly fast, except for the fact that it has low solubility. It doesn't, it is, it's nonpolar covalently bonded. And so it's not going to diffuse as well in water as carbon dioxide. In fact, carbon dioxide will often immediately undergo a chemical reaction with water. Right? So if diffusion is slow, if anything happens to slow down diffusion, like a change in the partial pressures, like uh, damage to the lungs resulting in increased uh, less surface area or increased diffusion distance, then usually you'll begin to feel the effects of hypoxia, which means low blood oxygen, before you begin to feel the effects of hypercapnia. All right, and so I'm going to end here for our part two. And next we're going to look at exactly how oxygen and exactly how carbon dioxide are transported within the blood. So. Here ends part two of the virtual lecture, and we will get started with part three when you start the next video.